This is our second segment of looking at synthesizing alcohols from organometallic compounds. In the first segment, we talked about just how to create organometallic compounds and some of the pitfalls that you can run into in creating those, such as the fact that organometallic reagents are strong bases and therefore you have to protect them from protic sources such as water. So you have to meticulously protect the reaction mixture so that it doesn't come in contact prematurely with water. So we're gonna take a look at now what we can do with those organometallic compounds once we create them in order to make alcohol products. And this is gonna be a really valuable reaction because not only is it going to create alcohol products, it's also going to create new carbon-carbon bonds in the process. So it's a two for one deal. Let's go ahead and look at some examples of the general layout of this reaction. So we'll take a look at the general overview of this reaction. So we're starting with an organometallic compound, which we recognize because we have carbon bonded to a metal. And then what we're going to bring in as our source of electrophilic carbon is a carbonyl carbon, like so. The solvent for this reaction is very commonly an ether, such as a specific ether that is often used as tetrahydrofurane, which is a five-membered ring that has one of the atoms of the ring as an oxygen to make that a cyclic ether. And the ether is going to be non-reactive as we desire. It is just there to provide a soup for the reaction to take place in. So what will happen here is that we can think of that carbon that I've shown in red up top and now I'm redrawing in blue as a carb anion because that carbon metal bond is very, very, very polarized due to the fact that the metal is much less electronegative than the carbon. So we think of the carbon as behaving as a carb anion, therefore meaning that that carbon is able to act as a nucleophile. The lone pair electrons from the carbon come over they're gonna form a covalent bond to the carbonyl carbon right here. And that's going to force the pi electrons from that carbon oxygen bond up onto the oxygen. And therefore, we have created a new carbon carbon bond here by having a carbon nucleophile attack the electrophilic carbon. And additionally, we're headed down the road to making an alcohol product. So our carbon that was acting as the nucleophile I'm putting in blue here. I'm gonna draw the new bond that it was created to the other carbon in green, and then the rest of the molecule here in black, that is our carbon that was bonded to the carbonyl, but is now a carbon-oxygen single bond, and then two R groups shown in black that were bonded to that carbon. So now at this point, we would have a negative formal charge up here on the oxygen, and this product would wait around in solution until we added a source of acid. And this doesn't have to be a very strong source of acid at all. In fact, at this point, you could either add acid or you could even add water as a suitably strong acid for this. But you have to wait to add water until that first reaction of the organometallic with the carbonyl group has completely taken place. Otherwise, you'll get an undesired outcome where that carbanion will act as an acid, as a base rather, to grab a proton from water as the acid. So controlling this, we add the acid at the very end or water at the very end. And what's going to happen is that the lone pair electrons from that oxygen anion, very eager to find a proton to team up with, so they'll come over and grab that proton, leading us to our final product of this reaction, a final alcohol product from this by doing that protonation step right here. So we're good to go on that. Now let's take this and go a step further and plug in some specific functional groups and some additional steps to the reaction as well to ramp this up just a little bit. So let's try to predict the major final organic product of this reaction. You're welcome to hit pause and try to work through this on your own and encouraged to do so. At step one, the product that results from step one, I'm just going to put one and put what that would yield. We expect that, as we saw in the last segment, the magnesium metal is going to come in and replace the bromine. So we're going to fill in a magnesium there, and then that bromine is going to remain complex to the magnesium. That'll be our product from the first step. And we could think of that in terms of how we're going to go through and logically think about this reaction as that carbon-magnesium bond being so, so polarized there that the electrons from that covalent bond really reside in possession of the carbon making that a carb anion. So then what will happen when we go into step two is we're gonna take the product from step one there, our carb anion type product, or organometallic or Grignard reagent as we could call it since it has a carbon magnesium bond that makes it fit the definition of a Grignard reagent. And our lone pair electrons come over, attack the electrophilic carbon atom, forcing the carbon oxygen 
pi bond electrons up onto the oxygen and giving us our product from this step. So we have an oxygen anion and now blue bond showing that new carbon-carbon bond that we've made and that new carbon-carbon bond connects back to our aromatic ringer. The, an abbreviated way of making an aromatic ring is draw a hexagon with a circle inside so that's how we get that circle. There would also of course be a hydrogen right here that was derived from this hydrogen of the aldehyde. We don't necessarily have to show that since it's a line angle formula but you can if you want to. So this is going to be the product that would result from step number two of the reaction sequence. And then step three of the reaction sequence is just going to be a protonation step. So for protonation, we take our proton, of course. We bring our base, our oxygen anion that is, over, grab that proton, and that's going to lead us to our final destination here of having an OH group in here. So we made both a new carbon-carbon bond within the molecule, that new carbon-carbon bond is right here, and we've also made a new alcohol group within the molecule by converting that carbonyl group from our starting material into an alcohol group in the final product. And do keep in mind in this situation, if all you were asked for in a problem was to provide the final reaction product, all you would absolutely have to write would be this. The rest of the stuff I've shown here would be your scratch paperwork in getting to that final product. So we're using the mechanism here as a tool to allow us to decipher what the final product is. Even if all we're asked for is the final product, I always generally like to make a mini mechanism showing some of the key steps to help me piece together what's going on and make sure that I'm not leaving any atoms out along the way. It is also always a really great idea to count at the end of your reaction that you haven't accidentally created or destroyed any carbon atoms along the way. In these reactions where we're making new carbon-carbon bonds, it's really easy to accidentally add or delete carbon atoms. So double check that you've done that correctly, that you've conserved the number of carbons from beginning to end. Let's do another example problem here. Okay, in this example problem, we're ramping up the intensity just a little bit more, creating a four-step reaction series. The first reaction is a throwback to our unit on alkynes, and the rest should be reactions that you are familiar with from the last couple of units here. Hit pause, try to see if you can do this, and then let's go from there. We start off by reacting 2-butyne with one equivalent of HCl, so we create our 2-butyne molecule. We react with one unit of HCl, one equivalent of HCl, and to decipher what the product of that reaction would be, we can kind of limp our way through it even if we don't remember exactly what's going on by thinking about logically what should go on in the mechanism. So we have an acid reacting with some of those pi bonds, so we expect that the pi bonds are going to come over and get protonated. The pi bond gets protonated by the acid first to give us a carbocation intermediate. So we'll go ahead and draw out that carbocation intermediate that would result here. So we'll go ahead and draw that out. like so. So we'll have a four carbon chain still, carbocation on one of those two, and the other one will have picked up a proton. So we started off with both carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond, carbon-carbon triple bond having no hydrogens bonded to them. Now one of those two right here will have a hydrogen directly bonded to it. Then we also have chloride anion that we've generated as a result of this first step of the mechanism. And so that chloride anion is going to very happily come in to act as a nucleophile and form a bond to the electrophilic carbocation. That will lead us to our final product resulting from this step. So that final product will correspond to placing a chlorine in here, right there. Now at this point then, at step two of the reaction, we bring in two equivalents of lithium. And what's going to happen when we bring in the lithium is that the lithium is going to replace the chlorine. So when the lithium replaces the chlorine, we're going to be left with a carbon-lithium bond. And it was two equivalents of, of lithium, which allows us to create as our other product lithium chloride to balance this out. So what we're really interested in here is the carbon-lithium compound, the organometallic compound. So this is what would result from step two of the reaction. This would be our product that we get out of that. And that's going to feed then into step three where we have our epoxide. So we have our epoxide present. 
with our organometallic compound, what's going to happen is that we could think of that carbon-lithium bond. Really, the electrons are not residing on the carbon, so we can really put this as a carb anion to abbreviate things out here. So our carb anion comes in, and what's going to happen with our carb anion is that it is going to act as a nucleophile to attack one of the two carbons, the less sterically hindered carbon of our epoxide here. They're both equally sterically hindered, so it doesn't matter which one they attack. That forces the oxygen carbon bond to break and leads us to our next intermediate that's going to correspond to having a new carbon carbon bond in this molecule. So I'm going to put my new carbon carbon bond here in red, like so. And then my atoms that were part of the epoxide I'm putting in blue. There's two carbon atoms there. The first carbon atom is the one that became connected to our nucleophile, which we've got in there. The second one is that CH2 group at the end right here that's going to become CH2 and then O minus. And finally, so this would be the result of step three of the reaction. Then finally, headed to home plate here, our final product is going to correspond to just protonating that group because we can protonate it by using that acid that's available in step four, our dilute HCl, the purpose of that is going to be to just lower the pH to the point that this protonation step will take place there. We're not using so much acid that will create an addition reaction across the carbon-carbon double bond. Instead, by using a dilute acid solution, that's just lowering the pH down to something closer to a neutral pH to promote the protonation of that oxygen. Now, that oxygen is super eager to be protonated because of the fact that it has that negative formal charge, making it a very reactive location in the molecule. So if you're asked to provide the final organic product of this series, all you would absolutely have to write would be this structure right here. And you will perhaps notice that when we think about the structure of this molecule, we do have an alkene group here that we've shown in the E in the rather Z configuration, but we could also create it in the E configuration as well. So this is the Z diastereomer. And if we we're thinking about putting all the stereoisomers down here, we would expect that E would also form. And the reason why we would expect that E would also form is if we come back a couple of steps in the mechanism over to right here in this region. When we had our nucleophile chloride attacking the electrophilic carbocation, that carbocation, as we talked about a couple of chapters ago with our alkyne chapter, would be expected to be linear because there's just two regions of electron density. And that means that the chlorine can attack from the top, which we've shown here, or from the bottom to in actuality give two different diastereomers right here corresponding to the E and Z forms here. And so since we were starting with the E and Z forms here, then what we're going to do is carry that all the way through. And that will allow us to give way at the very end to both the E and the Z configurations here. So if you're asked to show stereochemistry, we need to show both the E and the Z configurations here of this molecule. So let's do another example, and we're going to mix things up a little bit this time by giving the final major product that we're trying to yield and asking what Grignard reagent and aldehyde or ketone we can mix together to give this as the final product. So this is our targeted product, our blockbuster cancer drug or whatever you want to imagine that it is, and we're trying to figure out how to go about synthesizing it using a Grignard reagent and aldehyde or ketone. So we need to break this down and ask ourselves how we could go about creating this from an aldehyde or ketone and a Grignard reagent. I focus on the hydroxy group bond first, because remember that that's what needs to originate as our carbonyl group. So thinking backwards here, we can take and look backwards to convert that hydroxy group back into a carbonyl group, because that's what we have to start with, something that has an aldehyde or ketone. That's the specification that we're given. And we ask ourselves what that could be bonded to in order to enable us to create this product. So that carbonyl group needs to be bonded to two other groups. We could bond it, for example, to the two methyl groups here. 
So we could go like that. And then one of these bonds to that carbonyl group to give our final product is going to be a new bond. So we could say this is going to be our new bond there in blue. And so our new bond, if we think about how this reaction is constructed, is the bond that in the starting material is going to lead to the halogen atom. So thinking about that, we could put a um, halogen in here and that halogen, since we're asked to start specifically at a granular region, we actually don't need to show the halogen. We can show that directly as a magnesium, specifically magnesium chloride or magnesium bromide, whatever we want. So this carbon right here is the one we're trying to connect over to the carbonyl group. And then that one also would have the ethyl group bonded to it going like so right here. And we can ask ourselves whether the reaction that we've proposed here would work to lead us toward that product. And to do that, I like to use a little bit of electron pushing arrow magic here. So for the electron pushing arrow magic, I'm just gonna show our carbon here as a carb anion, like so. Comes over acting as the nucleophile to attack right here. That forces the oxygen hydrogen bond oxygen carbon bond to the pi bond to break and go up to there and so that would give us our final desired product after we did a protonation step so we do this carbon skeleton corresponds to this right here we made our new carbon carbon bond which we showed with our electron pushing arrow right here that we're showing in blue up top and then the groups that we show in red up top correspond to what we have in red right here. So these reagents would enable us to synthesize the final desired product using a Grignard reagent with an aldehyde or a ketone. That's one way to go about doing it is to provide as the, as the molecules that you would start with these two compounds that I'm showing right here. We can ask ourselves as well, is there any other correct way to go about doing this synthesis? So to ask that question and start to address it, what I will do is draw that targeted molecule again and try to dissect it in a slightly different way. So this is our target molecule. And previously we had said that we were gonna take the hydroxy group, which would originally be our carbonyl and have that carbonyl carbon bonded to the methyl group here and the methyl group here. An alternative is that we could have it just bonded to one of those two methyl groups and then at the other R group that it's bonded to have it bonded to the rest of this. So that would be a second approach for doing this. So let's take a look at what would happen if we tried that out. So if we try that out, I'm gonna put in red here, everything that would be bonded to our carbonyl carbon. So our carbonyl carbon is right here, bonded to the methyl group there. And then coming over the other way, we'd have our carbon right here, bonded to two methyl groups and bonded to an ethyl group. So we could do that. That's everything that we've shown in red there. And then our nucleophilic carbon, is going to need to be just actually a one carbon chain right here. So we could do CH3 MgBr as our Grignard reagent. And we think of that carbon then as what would act as our carb anion. So carb anion comes over, attacks the carbonyl carbon, forcing the electrons up onto the oxygen from that pi bond and leading us to the deprotonated form of our product. So it would lead us to a product right here that was just oxygen with anion. And then what we could do is simply protonate that by adding acid to get to the final targeted product here. So a second totally accurate answer for this would be that to create your final product, you could take the ketone shown here with methyl magnesium chloride or methyl magnesium bromide mix those two together in ether as the solvent, and you would get your intended reaction product minus the proton, and then add acid to protonate it. So you'd be good to go on that. So either of these two solutions are equally valid responses for the question. In the real world, if you were trying to plan out this reaction, you would have some other considerations such as the commercial availability of these compounds and the cost of these compounds. So in the next unit, what we're gonna do is continue looking at ways to synthesize alcohols and we're going to be focusing on ways to do that using so-called reduction reactions.